Well, praise the Lord, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, and of course, that means it is time for our midweek Bible study. We are so pleased that you have been able to come and be with us. I hope and pray that the next 90 minutes will prove to be a great blessing and an encouragement to you. I want to begin real quick by reminding folks that uh, this coming Sunday will be our final Sunday uh, at 3 o'clock p.m. We've been doing it at that time now for a great number of years. However, this Sunday will be the last 3 o'clock service. The following Sunday, the 4th of August, we are thrilled to announce that our services will be moving to Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, we will have an 11 o'clock a.m. service in Nashville. We are meeting in a dance studio complex. It's a pretty large place but it can get loud when there are other groups present. The owner of the complex informed me that uh, after our first few weeks or so, there will be another group meeting in another space. She isn't sure if the sound is going to be problematic for us or not, so I want to give you advance notice if it happens that the sound is <clears throat> intrusive upon our service at 11, we may have to change our service time to 12 because that other uh, outfit that comes in, it's much bigger and they're going to be using a much larger space. Um, they're their practice rehearsal whatever ends at noon so if it happens i'm kind of giving you advance notice if it happens that the sound is intrusive then we're going to be looking at moving our church service to noon instead of 11 but we'll see how that plays out okay uh just like to give folks uh, plenty of notice concerning these type of things. We will get everything ironed out for uh, Nashville. We're excited about Nashville. Uh, I've gotten some very nice messages back even today from some more people that I contacted there in Nashville. And uh, we just keep getting real kind, real nice uh, responses from people. So we are very, very hopeful that we're going to be able to realize our vision in Nashville, Tennessee. Most importantly for me is a move of God. That is the most important thing on my list of priorities. I could care less how many people, but I want the Lord to be present. I want the Lord to be real. I want the Spirit of God to be able to manifest itself, bringing salvation, restoration, healing, deliverance, uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost uh, to people, God willing, on a regular basis. That is my prayer. That is my goal. Uh, that is what we're hoping for, okay? All right, we want to move right into our Bible study tonight. We have been looking at the topic of ghosts, ghouls, and bumps in the night. This is everything um, of a paranormal nature from a biblical Christian perspective. There is a need for us to cover these types of subject matter. We did a study on this in our Dallas church. If you want to go to our Grace Oasis DFW channel on YouTube, go to the playlists, and there is a playlist there for a, I want to say, 23-week study we did on... Um, we titled it Paranormal 101, and uh, 
at that time we had folks that were in the building we were doing the teaching at the church and we had folks in the building um, so it's a little bit different you know I'm presenting in a little bit different a fashion I'm standing up in the pulpit and teaching and what have you um, you can go to that study you may enjoy that you might get as much or more out of that than you did this this has been a little bit more of a textbook style uh, presentation on this subject matter I must tell you, when the Lord spoke to me and laid on my heart to do the Paranormal 101 series, it was quite a number of years ago, I think close to 10 years ago now, I had no idea in the universe that that study was going to attract the viewership that it attracted. Many of our videos in that study series wound up getting thousands of views. We got a lot of feedback from people, heard from a lot of people, but I knew that there is such a uh, high interest in the world today concerning all things paranormal. Uh, every time you turn around, there's a new paranormal television show popping up. There's a new program uh, dealing with ghosts, dealing with um, mediums and psychics and, you know, all these sorts of things. And so there's this huge uptick in interest in the paranormal. Uh, we expect this according to the Word of God. We anticipated this. Uh, the Word of the Lord told us that this sort of thing was going to be on the rise as we draw near the end of this age and the return of the Lord, um, it is dangerous. And the problem is today that very few churches even address this subject matter. They don't even talk about it. They just ignore it. And it kills me how they ignore it when it, it takes up so much of Scripture. There, there are so many passages in the Old and New Testament that deal with demons and devils and unclean spirits, and yet in the modern age, the church has swept all that under the rug. No, that's too old-fashioned. That, you know, we don't want to look crazy. We don't want to look like nuts. Well, in the process, uh, people who are having issues with the paranormal are not able to go to the church for help because there are no churches that uh, are even aware of how to deal with these things. Even pastors and preachers um, do not understand these issues from a biblical Christian perspective. Well, one thing about this ministry you will learn uh, we're not afraid to go into the tough areas. We're not afraid to teach and preach on things uh, that need to be addressed. And, you know, my attitude is that people want to look at me like I'm nuts. Hey, so be it. Uh, all I know is I have seen people's lives changed instantaneously. I don't mean overnight. I mean in a matter of minutes. I've seen people go from stark raving nuts to as sober and sound as a judge, and their faculties have returned to them, uh, their ability to think, their ability to reason, uh, their ability to do the things in daily life that they need to do, which they had been hampered in doing for many, many years by demonic uh, oppression and possession. And I have seen God deliver and save so many times. So if you don't want to believe in this, hey, doesn't bother me no kind of way. When your loved one winds up dealing with this issue and the, the doctors can't do anything and medicine can't do anything, um, 
You'll be the first one to call me. I, I've had it happen before. You'll be the first one to call me and say, well, preacher, you know, maybe what you're saying has some legitimacy to it. I assure you it does. The spirit realm is real. That is the first premise of this teaching that we have done in, in this study. We started out talking about the fact that, yes, the spirit realm is real. Absolutely. There are two sides of the coin. There is good, there is evil. There is God, there is the devil. God has the angels of God which serve him. Satan has uh, demonic spirits which serve him. Uh, unlike what you often hear in many churches, I do not teach what I consider to be the hogwash doctrine that demons are fallen spirits, uh, fallen angels. Uh, they take one passage from the Word of God in order to infer this. And it is a passage from the book of Revelation. It is a passage which speaks of a warfare in heaven. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture does it say that Satan rose up and engaged in warfare against God at the time of his fall. Nowhere does it say that. No, the passage in Revelation is talking about an event that is yet to occur, an event that will occur uh, somewhere during the timetable of the Great Tribulation. And therefore, this suggestion, you know, that um, this uh, prophetic story that speaks of a third of the stars falling from the sky is referring to a third of the angel. I mean, folks, there is so much. You've got to read so much into that in order to come up with that cockamamie doctrine. And anybody who knows this old preacher knows, uh, I believe in letting the word of God speak where it speaks, and I believe in keeping my good mouth shut where the word of God is silent. If the scriptures do not address an issue, then it simply does not address an issue. That's all there is to it. You can try to, you know, twist other passages to somehow make it seem like maybe it's addressing this issue. No, we don't do that. Not in this ministry. So anyway, Demons, according to the word of God, God created both good and evil um, because there would be no choice between good and evil had God not created both. You know, he can't offer you black and white and only have created white. No, in order for us to even be tempted to go to the side of black, then black has to exist and God created uh, an entire network that works in that realm. And uh, that was in order to give us a choice. Do we want to love this world? And in so doing, love and worship the God of this world, which is what Satan is referred to as? Or do we want to, by faith, embrace a world to come? The scriptures declare, I have not seen ear hath not heard, neither hath entered in to the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So we don't, we can't even fathom, we can't even imagine what God's new heaven and God's new earth is going to look like. We can't even imagine uh, the capabilities we might have. You know, we can't even imagine the things we'll be able to do, the things we'll be able to explore, the things we'll be able to understand. Um, so we have an option in this life. We can either accept and understand that we are in fact made in the image and likeness of God, spiritual beings with an eternal life, with an everlasting existence. And whether we be saved or whether we be lost, we are going to exist eternally. The Word of God refers to 
uh, hell and death being cast into the lake of fire. And the scriptures declare this is the second death. And what that simply means is at that point, all the spirits that are in hell, that are uh, confined to hell, they're going to be living a death experience as it were. Uh, if you could almost imagine being buried alive, it doesn't mean that consciousness is lost, but it does mean that uh, like so many in this life, we struggle and struggle and struggle, and the best we're able to do is seemingly exist from day to day. We're not living life we're existing that will be the eternal outcome for the lost they will exist but they will not be living they will not be living in the presence of God they will not be living the glorified life that God has promised to those of us who believe and embrace his great gospel and yes we're an LGBT affirming church and yes, we take the word of God very seriously. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, my friend. That is a reality. You can twist and pervert scripture all you want to, to try to make it say something different. But that is what the word of God declares. And all I know is um, living for Jesus is a joy. I genuinely love living for the Lord, and having uh, the Spirit of God in my life is such a blessing and such a wonder. You see God working and blessing those of us who have been in this walk for any length of time. When you learn to walk in the favor and in the blessing of the Lord, uh, when you learn to believe God, to trust Him, to go to Him in prayer, to cast all your cares upon Him, because the Word of God declares, because He cares for you, meaning as a child of God, He is your caregiver. Doesn't mean He just has warm, mushy feelings for you. No, it means we cast all our cares upon Him because he is our caregiver. He said, no, I'm your father. Just as a child would go to their father to have their father do things for them which they cannot do for themselves, even so as children of God, we're able to run into the throne room of grace and cry out to God and our heavenly father will do for us what we are incapable of doing for ourselves. And I'm telling you, folks, when you learn to walk in the favor of the Lord, when you begin to experience God's divine favor, when you begin to experience his blessing in your life, when you see God answer prayer, and I don't mean little prayers. I mean, like David said uh, in the book of Psalms, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits who forgiveth all thy sins, who healeth all thy diseases, who delivereth thy life from destruction. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, God has delivered me from destruction, literally, on God only knows how many occasions. He has protected me when I could have been killed. He has saved my life and preserved my life when the doctors gave up hope and said I had 24 hours to live. And anybody who knows anything about the medical profession, uh, you know that when a doctor says that they have 24 hours, uh, that literally means any minute. They can be gone any minute. And I've been in that position more than once. And God has delivered me miraculously. I have literally had doctors from teaching hospitals come to my bedside in order to talk to me because according to them, I defied every law of science. I broke every rule in the book, in the medical books. And they said, one doctor told me one time, he said, Charles, you should be dead. 
you, there's no way you should be able to sit here right now and talk to me. He said, I don't know how you're doing it. Um, uh, toxins in my body had uh, exploded. I had um, my the levels of toxins in my blood were so high that he literally said to me, if I were to take a small vial of your blood right now and pump it into an elephant, the elephant would drop dead on the ground. He said, and yet you're sitting here talking to me. So I don't know how it's possible. Amen. The word of God said, if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. Hallelujah. So I guess that means I can have uh, something toxic and deadly in my body, but God can preserve me and keep me going. Amen. That's one miracle. Got to say this before we get moving, praying and moving into our study. I got to tell you, that is one miracle a lot of people overlook. A lot of people do not consider. Uh, there are miracles which are instantaneous. There are miracles of healing and things of this nature which occur and boom, you're healed and the sickness is gone, the disease is gone. But there is another form of miracle whereby God preserves us, meaning sickness and disease can be raging in our bodies. And according to science, we should have died already. And yet the Lord keeps us going. I've had this happen and God kept me going until he decided, okay, now I'm going to give you that miracle. I'm going to give you that healing. And I've told Tommy many times when I went through an issue, uh, went deaf in my I think I want to say it was my left ear. I forget now. It's been several years back. Went to a specialist, went to the ear doctor, and the doctor said, I'm sorry, but the bones in your ear have ceased up and blah, blah. He said, this will be uh, for the rest of your life. You're going to be deaf in that ear. That's what the ear specialist told me, the ear doctor. And um, about a month or so later, went back to the doctor, got tested again. And all of a sudden, I was 97% restored to hearing in my left ear. The doctor called me on the phone. I left a message on my phone. And he started the message out by saying, Well, hello, Superman. That's what he said. Couldn't explain it. Had no explanation. Could not for the life of him understand how it happened. But I had gone to a church, had them lay hands on me and pray for me, anointing me with oil, and I knew God would keep his promise. And I told Tommy, I didn't walk out of that service immediately healed. But I told Tommy, I said, God keeps his word. Therefore, all I have to do now, I've done my part. All I have to do now is wait and the answer will come. He'll send that miracle. But sometimes God holds off on miracles in our lives because he wants to perform a greater miracle. He may want to lift you up off your deathbed like he did me in the year 2000. He may want to literally lift you up off your deathbed so that he can shock scientists and shock the medical profession as he did in my instance. And uh, we must simply keep our faith intact and just believe God and trust him. And uh, uh, this is, you know, uh, this is the one lesson that I think a lot of believers uh, tend to not consider. They may have cancer, for instance, and they're trying, they're, believe in God for a miracle. They're believing God for healing. The healing doesn't come. The healing doesn't come. The healing doesn't come. Finally, they're in a very bad state. They're in a really terrible condition. The preacher comes in to an honor with all and pray for them, and they've already made up their mind that apparently now this is my time to die. 
And uh, so now they've done turned their faith off. Their faith is not even engaged anymore. So uh, the preacher can pray till the cows come home, but their faith has been turned off. They're not believing the Lord any longer. And this is the danger for believers. The scripture said, he that believeth unto the end shall be saved. And that's not just our salvation, but that is true of any miracle you need in your life. Folks, you got to trust God and believe God until it's all over. Amen. And uh, just trust him that he's going to come through. If you've done your part and you've done what he has asked for you to do to receive that miracle, that healing, if you've called for the elders of the church to come anoint you with oil, lay hands on you and pray for you in the name of the Lord, the promise of God's word is not, and he may save the sick. No. The promise of God's word is, and he shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. So you can know if you've done your part, God is going to do his part. It may be a little different timing than you'd prefer, but the Lord is trusting you to keep your faith and not to give up, but to continue to believe God until the answer comes. Let's go to the Lord in prayers. We began preaching and we hadn't even started our study tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayers. We begin our Bible study this evening. Master, Savior, Redeemer, and King, we come before you tonight, O oh God, grateful for our salvation, grateful for our walk with you grateful for the relationship that you have made available to us through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. We thank you, Lord, for the tremendous lengths that you went to in order to bring this salvation to humanity. God, you designed and created a divine drama. You play every role. You play every part. And in the end, oh God, you'll be our judge as well as our advocate. And Master, tonight, in the name of Jesus, we loose tonight, Lord, the spirit of revelation. We ask God that uh, the Spirit of God would descend upon us, anoint us, Lord, anoint me to teach, anoint everyone that listens to hear, that they might receive the truths of God's Word. This is such important information. This is such an important subject, and it is so important tonight, O oh God, that we understand these things. Open our minds, open our hearts, open our spirits to receive from your spirit tonight. And let the knowledge, Lord, that we glean this evening bring forth fruit unto victory, fruit unto life, fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. We ask it all in none other, none other than Jesus' precious saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, I said a few moments ago that it amazes me how this subject matter relative to the paranormal really just goes unaddressed entirely uh, in the church world. A lot of times something may happen of a supernatural or a paranormal nature, and preachers and Christians will say, oh, well, that's demonic, you know, that's just devilish, that's of the devil. And the next question is, well, how do I deal with it? And they don't know. Their pastor hasn't taught on it. Uh, they have not been educated in these matters. They don't understand what to do. We've been talking about ghosts and hauntings. Uh, we spoke of the fact that from a biblical perspective, ghosts cannot be the spirit of uh, people who once lived and walked this earth. They cannot be. Scripture declares that there is 
a destination for every spirit that leaves the human body. The moment it leaves the human body, that spirit becomes God's property once again to do with as he pleases. You can't leave your body and then sit there and tell God, oh, well, Lord, you just wait because I'm afraid of the judgment, so I'm not going to go up into the light yet because I'm afraid that uh, you're going to wind up sending me to hell, so I'm just going to wander. That's asinine. That's absurd. The notion of that implies that God is powerless to call that soul before him so that he might mete out justice, divine justice. And we know that certainly is not true. Neither is it true that we can love something in this world so much that we become attached to it. And therefore, when our spirit departs the body, we just can't separate ourselves from that piece of jewelry or that music box or that piece of furniture or that house or that farm or that barn or that car or that watch or any other object. That is insane. It is unscriptural. The Word of God says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the things that are in the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Honey, if you love anything in this life so much that after death you would want to stay so you could remain attached to it, then you cannot be saved. There's no way in the world you can be a child of God because the scriptures declare, if any man love the world of the things that are in the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Got news for you, children. God has blessed me. Uh, I got two cars in the in the driveway. I love both of them. They're beautiful vehicles. I enjoy driving them. I consider myself blessed that God allows me to have them. But sweetheart, when the trumpet blows, this old boy is ready for heaven. I have no interest in the universe in hanging around so that I can sit in this car for eternity or sit in my pickup truck for eternity. That is insane. It is pure insanity. No. After we leave the physical realm, when our spirit departs the physical realm, there is a whole new realm of existence uh, that spirits pass into. That realm of existence is overseen by God. Therefore, God determines where that spirit now goes. Uh, there is no other option. You can't choose this or that. We looked at the Word of God and we found that every single um, description, everything that the so-called paranormal experts ascribe to uh, ghosts and hauntings. All of these things are unavailable to the spirit of human beings that have passed. However, all of these things are possible for both angels and demons. So, we learn that uh, uh, human beings, the Word of God said, we came into this world naked, and it is certain, that means it's absolute, that we depart naked. Now that's funny because our loved ones dress us in a nice suit or in a pretty dress and put us in a box and bury us in the ground. So what does he mean by that? He means our spiritual man is... Uh, doesn't possess anything in the natural realm. There is nothing of the natural that translates with us into the spiritual. Therefore, you're not going to have the outfit you were buried in. You're not going to have the uniform you wore to work. You're not going to have uh, the overalls you wore on the farm or your favorite tie or, or your favorite hat and all these things. All of these things become props for 
demonic spirits who are seeking to convey a false message. Their job, their primary job in this life is to deceive. And these deceptive spirits will assume the identity of a human being who has passed. Uh, they generally, yes, they're going to use someone who is known to have lived at this location, someone who is known to have died at this location, and they're going to use dress and attire as um, props. They use all kinds of things as props in order to establish uh, their identity as that person. However, they're even they're representing themselves as that person without them saying a word, without them saying anything. Somebody seeing an apparition uh, of this person, um, immediately the message is conveyed that after death you need not be concerned about God, you need not be concerned about judgment, you need not be concerned about heaven or hell. Everything the Word of God told you is bunk. That's what the message is uh, when we see this apparition and we believe that it is that person. When you believe the Word of God and you have absolute, absolute conviction in the Word of the Lord as all believers ought to, then we reject that identity as a person who has departed. We reject the notion of this, and having rejected it, we can then address that spirit for what it is. So you want to come against something that is, quote-unquote, haunting your home or haunting your business or haunting some property or some uh, place of yours, then you're able to come against it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as a deceptive spirit. And you'll find victory. You'll find all of a sudden you're going to find out that those things aren't so hard to get rid of. They're not nearly as difficult to address. Now I want to point out, we've talked about the fact that we are, in fact, in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual warfare. The Word of God declaring in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is where many Christians, especially those that deny the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Baptists and that branch, um, this is where they make huge mistakes because they paint people as the enemy. They paint people as evil, as wicked, as demonic, as devilish, as unholy. And then they fight with these people. When the reality of our warfare is we're not fighting people. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. Our warfare is a spiritual warfare. And the enemy laughs while the church fights people because the whole time they're fighting against these people, one, they're not fighting him, and two, they are turning these people off to the Word of God, turning them off to the gospel, pushing them away from the church, pushing them away from Christ. And they're actually doing the enemy's bidding. So he wins all the way around. He's got these ding -a -lings doing his job for him, and all the while, he is unbothered. He is not being vexed by the church 
The Lord said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But honey, if you're not coming up against the gates of hell because you're so busy coming up against LGBT people, you're so busy coming against, L excuse me, abortion clinics, you're so busy coming up against uh, the county being wet instead of dry, you know, uh, you, you are playing right into the enemy's hands. What scares Satan to death is a church and a ministry and preachers who know what their mission is and who know what they're fighting and how to fight it. The word of the Lord tells us as well, In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Now listen to what our weaponry, our spiritual weaponry that God has given us, helps us to do. It helps us to pull down strongholds. Listen, casting down imaginations, meaning fictional thoughts of man's own invention, fictional thoughts of man's own design. Listen to these so-called uh, paranormal experts on these television shows. They're full of imaginations. That's all of their theories, all of their uh, thoughts, everything they peddle as to what this is and why this happens this way and why this happens that way. And if you listen to five different experts, you'll hear five different opinions. If you listen to Zach, he'll say, yeah, we determined it's the ghost of Joe Blow who lived here back in the 1800s. If you listen to Amy, uh, can't think of her, Alan, uh, she'll turn around and tell you, oh, it's, it's aliens, and I'm, and somehow or another, she's able to not only communicate with the dead, but she's able to communicate with aliens. Well, if I might stop for a moment and do a little caveat here, does that not then play into what we talked about the last two weeks when I spoke of the fact that aliens are very likely also of demonic origin. What people see and experience uh, in the way of alien uh, visitation uh, and abduction may very well be uh, demonic in nature. And if you've got these so-called psychics and paranormal, you know, wizards who are able to not only um, speak with the dead, according to them, and ghosts and spirits. But they're also able to see aliens, and when aliens have been active, what does that tell you, folks? I remember when Amy Allen first came on her program. She started that program with that Steve Dushabi, or however you pronounce his last name. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm horrible with names, okay? Or Dushabi, whatever it is. Um, she cracked me up because in the first episode or two, you heard her talking about, well, you know, I don't really believe in demons and devils and, you know, um, people use those terms, but I don't really believe in those things. You know what? <clears throat> About a year into her program, all of a sudden, she was running into demons and devils around every corner. <laughs> Tommy and I know we watched her and I said, boy, isn't it funny for somebody who doesn't believe in demons and dark spirits and evil spirits, all of a sudden, man, she's diagnosing a lot of those things around. You watch her show. 
You watch her show as it progressed, and you'll see that very often, all of a sudden, she's saying, well, I don't think this is a human spirit. I, but you see, there's where the deception comes in. These spirits are so gifted at what they do that they're able to present themselves, quote unquote, as a human spirit. And these so-called psychics and mediums and experts believe it. And they, the more powerful spirits, we talked about the fact that demons operate in echelons. Their principalities and powers, meaning their layers and levels of authority and power. So what happens is the lower level spirits they're dealing with are simply spirits of deception. Those are the ones running around represent dressing up like the old lady who died there or dressing up like the uh, Civil War soldier who died in that house, you know. Uh, those are the level, lower level. Those are the less powerful. But all of a sudden when she comes face to face with one of the higher level and that spirit is not worried about, he doesn't care about trying to present himself as anything. He is happy to come at you uh, as a spirit of fear or as a spirit of depression or as a spirit of suicide or a spirit of murder um, or, or a spirit of deviance, you know, a spirit of perversion, a spirit of lust, whatever it might be. Now, Amy never discerns these spirits um, in a biblical fashion because we understand that spirits are identified by the work they do. And uh, we talked about it, I'm repeating for anybody that I hadn't heard, talked about the fact that human beings, uh, we adopt names that are based uh, oftentimes on where a person is from, you know, uh, what, what town they, their ancestors came from, or what kind of work an ancestor did. You've got, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Carpenter, and you've got Mr. and Mrs. Parsons, you know, because their ancestors were ministers, Parsons. Uh, their ancestors worked with wood and built homes and furniture and what have you, carpenters. And that name became their last name. Well, demons are identified in the same exact way, except it's a little more straightforward. If a demon's work is simply to um, promote lust, in your life so that lust overtakes you and you cannot control your lusts, then that spirit would be referred to as a spirit of lust. If there is, a, a, if the spirit is a spirit whose only job is to promote depression, then it is the spirit of depression. If it is a spirit, spirit whose job it is to push and motivate to murder. And I was talking last week, for instance, about David Berkowitz, uh, the famous serial killer from the 1970s. Um, he was running rampant around New York, and as I recall, he was killing couples. And um, when he was finally found and captured and all that, it was abundantly obvious to many people that this man had demons. It, the, even people who didn't understand these things said there was something diabolical, there was something evil just emanating from this man. And this man claimed that he received instruction and he actually spoke to a cat and that this cat would speak to him, and that it was these things that were pushing him to murder. David Wilker, excuse me, David Berkowitz in prison uh, found Jesus and became a born-again Christian. So far as I know, he's still alive, and I've seen uh, his testimony. It's a powerful testimony, and God had to deliver him from these demons that was in fact, demonic, and the, the, uh, he had a spirit of murder that had come into his heart. 
and was pushing him uh, to murder and causing him to derive some sense of pleasure and some sense of joy and satisfaction through the act of taking other human lives. So we understand that's how spirits operate. Um, Amy comes a, a, upon these spirits, and she never identifies it as such, but as Tommy and I are uh, watching the show, we don't watch it all the time or anything, but when we've watched it, uh, I'll, t I'll be able to tell him. I'll tell him, I'll say, now she's talking about a spirit of murder. Now she's talking about a spirit of suicide. Now she's talking about a spirit of fear. And um, uh, so from a biblical perspective, when you understand how these things work, even as you watch these so-called experts talk about what they're seeing and how they're seeing it, and how they perceive it, you're able, from a biblical perspective, to understand exactly what they're dealing with. Um, when I cast demons out of a person, and I've had, uh, I've had the opportunity on any number of occasions, um, the Lord will most often, especially if there are more than one, if there's a number of them, uh, the Lord will uh, allow me to discern what each and every spirit is. And I literally just call them out by name. You spirit of depression, you spirit, you suicidal spirit, you spirit of anger. You know, every spirit that has invaded that person's life, I'm able to call it out by name. And uh, oftentimes, again, the Lord will allow me to know um, how it is that this person inadvertently, purposely or unpurposely, I say purposely or unpurposely, in other words, they may have been involved in some religion that actually welcomes, you know, spiritual activity and, uh, and, and spiritual uh, demonic possession. And there are religions that do this. I've known people that were part of these. Um, or they may have unknowingly, unwittingly opened the door. And it's funny because, you know, um, Jesus said, He that hateth his brother without a cause is a murderer. He's guilty of murder. Hating your brother without a cause is the same as murder. And that is one area where we need to be careful because we can wind up opening a door up to a spirit of murder. How? By killing somebody? No. By hating somebody that the Word of God has commanded us to love, our brother, whether that be our natural brother, whether that be our brother or sister in the faith, hating them without a cause. You know, there are many people in the LGBT community who for many, many years have... Uh, um, I don't know how to say it except just to say it. Uh, they've been trying to go out of their way to destroy my reputation. They've come against my integrity. They've passed all kinds of gossip and all kinds of accusations. Uh, all because some 20-something years ago, I was contacted by a man uh, who wanted me to be part of a of a a kind of a denomination of LGBT affirming Pentecostal churches that he was putting together and he was going to be the pontiff, you know, he was going to be the high holy roller, the top dog, and he wanted me to get up underneath him and be one of his uh, subservient, you know, ministers. And uh, when he called me, to be frank, I had just gotten out of the hospital in 2000. And um, I, I'm not sure. I don't think my body had cleared all the uh, drugs yet. So I, I went through some really bad um, mood swings when I was under the influence of these drugs. I 
uh, what my mother could tell you, you know, I'd get very moody and, and crabby and, you know, yell at people and stuff. And then finally, when all that cleared out, all of that mess stopped, you know. But anyhow, um, and that includes, for those of you who are in the medical profession, that includes drugs like Ativan. I was literally weaning off of Ativan, uh, which... Um, is a very powerful drug that has some really negative side effects, including heightening a sense of uh, anxiety in you to a point that you wouldn't believe. But anyhow, and this man contacted me, wanted be, me to be part of his group and all that. And I had gone to a conference and met him and met others that he claimed he was working with to put this little thing together. And frankly, they treated me as well as the number of other ministers that I knew, people in the movement that I was friends with, people I admired, people I respected, people that I loved. And that little clique of his treated the rest of us, not just me, but the rest of us, like we, you know, like we had leprosy. I'd try to talk to them, and they'd just turn their head and walk away. These people didn't want anything to do with us. We weren't good enough for them for whatever reason. But all of a sudden, he's putting together this little organization, and he wants me to be part of his little organization because, after all, he's going to be the top dog, and I'd be one of the pastors under him, you know. And in my state of mind, I asked him, and I said, well, what qualifies you to be my overseer? What? What qualifications do you have that make it so that I should seek your covering for my ministry? And he threw out some stuff, and I said, well, brother, I know, I know a thousand preachers that have those same qualifications, and those are not qualifications for a bishop. Those are not qualifications for an overseer in my mind, you know, and I said, and I'm going to be honest with you, and I told you I was kind of in a crabby frame of mind at the moment. I said, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, me and Brother Rollins and Sister uh, Gordon and Brother uh, um, Goss and blah, 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 and this, I said, at that conference y'all had, I said, you all treated us like we were lepers. You didn't have time for us. We could barely shake your hand because you literally behaved as though you had no interest in us whatsoever. None. And I said, and frankly, I'm not interested in being part of any group that you folks are at the head of. And this man literally began to throw accusations at me because I said this to him, well, you're, you know, you're, you're just a filthy thing. And if you don't even know how to shower and bump, I mean, you want to believe the stuff this guy started saying to me. And so I told him, I said, listen, I love God's people and I don't hate you, but I certainly don't want to be part of any group you're going to be the head of. I'll tell you that right now. I said, but if y'all are doing something and you know, and, uh, and you're having a function like a rally or a, a conference or something, I said, I'll be happy to fellowship, but I do not want to officially be a part. Well, long story short, that man set out that day to absolutely destroy me to say everything wicked and evil he could possibly say about me and uh, in this little group he started and to this day there are people in that group who will say nothing positive about me they will talk bad about me they will run me through uh, the ringer never having met me never having spoken to me, never having observed our ministry. Folks, that is dangerous. I'm not giving this story just to be telling a story. I'm trying to illustrate something. The Lord said, you cannot hate your brother without a cause. 
what have I done to any of these individuals to merit this kind of treatment? They won't fellowship with me. They won't. I, over the years, I've reached out to a number of different ones that were part of this group. Uh, there were a few people who became a part of it that I liked and I appreciated their ministry. And I invited them and I sent them an email and said, I'd love for you to come minister for us sometime. I think while we were in Dallas, you know, and uh, they never even responded to my message. There were pastors uh, in nearby churches that I reached out to and I said, you know, we'd love to fellowship with you, but never, they didn't even respond to my message. Jesus said, he that hateth his brother without a cause. Honey, if you hate on somebody all because brother so-and-so told you, that brother so-and-so told him, that brother so-and-so told him, that brother so-and-so told him, because 20-something years later, they're not getting it firsthand. They're hearing it fifth-hand, sixth-hand, seventh-hand. Okay, all the accusations, all the foolishness that's been... And I've just been out there doing the work God called me to do. I don't talk about them. This is the one time in, in years that I've ever mentioned this foolishness. I don't talk about it. I don't talk about them. I don't talk them down. Uh, I don't level accusations against them, you know. Um, I just do the work God has called me to do. But we need to be careful. We are in a spiritual warfare. The enemy loves to divide and conquer. If the enemy can have us warring against one another, if he can have us warring amongst ourselves, he will do so. I just had somebody today on Facebook send me a private, I think it was a private message, and he said, I know uh, somebody in the Nashville area who actually is doing an affirming work of some nature or another. And uh, he said, you know, here's his name, so on and so forth. Well, I've already sent that person a friend request. I happen to find them in my uh, doings, you know, on Facebook. And I already sent that person a friend request. Haven't heard anything back from him yet. But I responded to this individual and I said, we're always happy to cooperate with other churches. Folks, I'm going to act like a Christian even when others don't because I know how I'm supposed to act. And I'm going to tell you something. When our church in Connecticut, when I was pastoring an affirming work in my home state of Connecticut, uh, an Episcopal church allowed us use of their sanctuary for a little while. And at one point, the pastor asked me if I would be willing to participate in a special service they were having in the Episcopal church. Um, their bishop was coming in, and it was a big to do. I didn't really understand what all it was. I'm not, you know necessarily all that familiar with Episcopal tradition and rituals and what have you. Anyway, and so in a spirit of friendship, these people were very nice to us. They were very kind to us. Uh, I don't agree with their doctrine. I don't agree with their belief systems entirely, but I knew, I know they preach, teach, and believe Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for the sins of a lost world. He lay in the grave three days. He rose on the third day, victorious over hell, death, and the grave. He ascended to heaven. I know they, they teach these fundamentals, these basics of the faith. So I told her, I said, well, yes, absolutely, you know. Um, and over the years, when Tommy and I, he can tell you, when we were in Dallas, there were numerous uh, LGBT affirming churches in Dallas. And one church did a uh, what they called a praise in the park, where they had kind of like a singing, oh, what we would call a singing. A bunch of folks got up and sung gospel music and Christian songs and what have you in a uh, 
city park and it was like a praise event and what have you and they asked if we would participate and if we had anybody that could sing and all and we did you know and we participated uh we went tommy and i went and visited their church just to show ourselves friendly one sunday uh, we did the same thing for an MCC in Dallas at one point. We actually visited several churches in Dallas um, just in order to show ourselves friendly and to demonstrate that we were cooperative and we were friendly. And uh, I'll be honest with you, we never one time, not one time, did we ever get any form of reciprocation. Uh, that, that's a whole nother story. You know, we would do, we tried to do our spring fellowship conference and what have you. And did they even send one person from their church to represent their church at our conference? No, they didn't bother. But we did. We, if they were doing something special and they extended an invite to us, we would always participate. If we could help them in some way, we would help them. Um, so uh, I love people that love the Lord. And there are a lot of people in the world who love the Lord that don't know what I know about God. They haven't received the revelation of one God in Christ and Jesus is his name. They may not have yet received revelation concerning the baptism uh, in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. They may not have yet come to an understanding and a revelation of the great and glorious Holy Ghost baptism. Uh, whatever, that's fine. Everybody is where they're at in their spiritual journey. Everybody, you know, uh, everybody is not fully mature and grown up and, and fully knowledgeable of all things. No, it, people are in various denominations or in various groups or in various churches uh, because they're at different places in their life. They're at different levels of understanding and revelation. And am I going to uh, avoid them? And believe me, there are a lot of Pentecostal people that do, sadly. Uh, they don't want nothing to do. If you're not part of their number, if you're not part of their denomination, if you're not part of their doctrine, they, they just don't bother with you, you know. And uh, I think that's pitiful. Uh, we embrace everybody. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and, um, and you know, you understand the fundamentals and your faith is in the fundamentals of the Christian faith, his death, burial, literal, physical resurrection for the salvation of humanity, then I can embrace you and I can love you. And uh, so I'm trying to talk about here. I know I, this all started with me talking about hating your brother without a cause. There's a method to my madness. We have to guard ourselves. We have to be careful about falling into these traps. Um, if somebody comes to me and they have something negative to say about some preacher I know or some Christian I know, um, I don't just buy it. I don't just believe it. Um, there was a pastor in New York that I preached for, a Spanish pastor of a Spanish church. And when I preached in his, he was he was straight, mainstream Pentecost. He had a good, good-sized church and everything. And uh, he had invited me to come preach for him, I don't know how many times. And he and I became friends, his wife. I was in the delivery room with his daughter when his daughter was having a baby because mom and dad were in church. And they this is before cell phones. And uh, they hadn't yet been notified that she was uh, in labor. And she begged me to please come with her to the hospital. And, and when they tried to separate us, you know, well, they said, only family can go into the delivery room with you. She said, he's my brother. He's my brother. And so, long story short, I went in with her. Um, that was an experience I'll never forget. Uh, not real pleasant, as you can imagine. 
but I held her hand and I comforted her and prayed with her and prayed for her while she was going through a very difficult delivery. Um, but this man, you know, he wound up at one point, somebody leveled accusations against him of a very, very serious nature. And sadly, he wound up resigning his church and leaving and moving to another state, kind of in shame, uh, because somebody, and it was only one person in this church, leveled these very serious accusations against him. And um, I don't know if they were true or not. I find it very difficult, based on my knowledge of the man, I find it very difficult to believe. However, at the same time, I understand we're human, and sometimes people do some terrible things, you know. But the bottom line is this. I don't care what he's accused of. I'm going to love him, okay? I'm going to support him. I'm going to be there for him. If he needs restoration, then I want to be there to be there for him for restoration. I've been contacted by ministers, folks, that I knew in denominations that I previously have been part of. And they, um, some of them have come out and are now actually in affirming ministry. Uh, one in particular is not out. He's very much closeted. And, uh, and yet, you know, he confessed some things to me. He's gay and told me a whole bunch of stuff that honestly a lot of it I'd rather not have even heard. And, uh, you know, I told him in response, I said, brother, uh, I would love to be there for you in any way possible if it will help you to walk in in restoration and to walk in victory and and to do the right thing. You know, I said, I'm there for you, and I'll always be there for you. So, I say all that to say, it's awful pitiful when we can hate a brother without a cause. When we can hold a grudge against somebody we never met, we don't know, we've never talked to them. Um, I've had people say nasty things that being a preacher as many years as I have about their pastor or about a preacher, you know, and being in ministry as long as I've been in ministry, honey, I'm going to tell you a little secret. I could see right through them. I could see right through them. I knew exactly why they were saying what they were saying uh, I, because I've been there. I've seen it. I've lived it. <laughs> if I haven't gone through it in my own ministry, I I've seen it in other ministries, and uh, people will say things, nasty, negative, rude, obnoxious, hateful accusations, and what have you, for any number of reasons. And in ministry, there's um, sibling rivalry. You know, you have sibling rivalry, uh, or professional rivalry even, um, and professional conflicts among ministers. You know, it's sad, but it happens. And so, therefore, you know, when somebody comes to me, has something to say about somebody I've never met, somebody I don't know, I may take it into, you know, into advisement, you know, and kind of keep it in the back of my head. But I am not going to accept it as fact and, and approach that other person based on what this person told me. No, but if I meet that person and I'm seeing all of the things, evidence that I've heard, well, then I will know, you know, that, well, yeah, I, I, I'm afraid I'm seeing stuff that would support what I've heard. You know what I'm saying? So anyway... Part of walking a spiritual life and guarding ourselves from spiritual influences coming into our lives uh, has to do, folks, with a whole lot more than just, um, I'm going to say it this way, the in-your-face issues, meaning uh, murder, obviously, is an in-your-face kind of an issue, okay? Okay. But what people don't realize is if they allow themselves to become hateful towards someone, if they allow themselves to 
uh, mistreat others and to have bad attitudes and bad thoughts towards somebody without a just cause. What did that person say? What did that person do to you that would even make you have these negative thoughts or negative feelings about them or what have you. If you can answer nothing, then you are walking on very thin ice. You're in very dangerous territory. You're not far from being able, the enemy is not far from being able to push you over the cliff, as it were, into a murderous mindset. If you can hate somebody without knowing anything about it, look at racism, look at xenophobia, look at homophobia, how people can hate groups of people without a cause. That person hadn't done nothing to them. They say, well, but, you know, queers do this and queer. Uh, honey, there ain't nothing you can say. There's not one stinking accusation you can make that applies to every uh, gay, lesbian person on this planet. Got news for you. I've been in this work for 31 years, and the LGBT community is so much more complex than you could ever imagine. And it is diverse. There is a reason that we use the rainbow flag as a symbol representing the diversity of the LGBT community. You've got LGBT people who are registered Republicans, who are dyed in the wool conservative in their uh, in their political views, conservative in their social views. Um, you know who. Uh, work in uh, high-level, super high-level positions, make tons and tons of money. Then you got people as well who are working at McDonald's, making it a little bit, who are registered Democrats, who couldn't give a flying fig about politics, who really don't care. They very seldom vote. You know, I could go through a whole list of, of you know, things, but you get my point. There is such diversity in the LGBT community. And the thing that makes me laugh is most of these people who hate without a cause um, have these ideas of what LGBT people look like. And what they don't know is that the man who owns the house next door to them is gay. And just because that man uh, is divorced from his wife and has a couple of kids and uh, doesn't live with a man, you know, uh, they're thinking that they know what his situation is. When in reality, you know, he can be a multimillionaire, he can own a, a $5 million home and drive, you know, uh, Mercedes and all that. And he's as gay as a $3 bill, if I can say it that way. So the notion of hating anybody without a cause. And uh, I actually saw something recently. I don't know why I've gone into this so deep tonight. I had no intention to. But the Holy Ghost must have some purpose in it. Um, I actually heard a story recently about a man who at one time embraced... Uh, really rabid uh, racism, you know, and he was, I'm trying to think, a fireman or, or a first responder of some sort, and he actually said that if he had to respond to a situation and there were uh, people of color involved, he would purposely let them die. This man confessed to this, and he said now it haunts him, and his conscience is so horrified by what he did and how he behaved. But you see, folks, this is what I'm talking about. This is how the enemy works. If Satan can get you to hate without a cause, murder is not far away. You might think it is, but it's not. Murder 
is not far away. If you can hate immigrants without a cause, look at these people. There was some man, I think, down near the Texas border, Arizona border, whatever it is, and some uh, immigrant had come to his door seeking some kind of help or something. And this man just shot him dead because he was an immigrant. And uh, and he wound up, the courts wound up letting him go free. You know, uh, so hating without a cause, my friend, you are literally one tick away from a murderous spirit. And so we need to be mindful and we need to be careful that this is why the Lord said this to us, so that we can guard our minds and protect our lives and our spiritual well-being by purposefully making the effort not ever to hate anyone without a cause. And even if you have a cause, the Word of God said, love your enemies. So you're not given license to hate anyone, even if they have done something. He said, pray for them, which do despitefully use you. So even if that person has done something, you're still not given license. God still doesn't say, okay, now you're justified in hating them. No, because hate, and there is a spirit of hatred, hate and the next spirit is the spirit of murder. And uh, there are people in our society, there are, I'm going to say it plain today, there are registered Republicans all over America today who have a spirit of hatred toward this group of people, toward that group of people. They have a, a hatred toward uh, the people in this profession, for instance, um, uh, abortion care uh, workers, nurses, doctors, so on. They hate them. They hate them, you know. And if this nation were to fall into a state of civil war, these people would, people who profess Christianity, it would take them five seconds to be willing to pull out a gun and start killing the people that they hate the people they identify, their gay neighbors, uh, their abortion care uh, doctor that lives across the street, you know, their black uh, neighbor. Do you follow what I'm saying? So uh, if we don't want to ever get to the place of being murderous in our thinking, then we must guard ourselves against being hateful without a cause. Um, got to tell you folks, I'm serious when I say this. I have found over the years that I've been in ministry when the Spirit of the Lord kind of brings me off in some direction. There's a reason for it. I don't understand it because tonight that is not even close to what I was planning on covering. Um, but I think that that must surely have been um, a topic that the Spirit of the Lord wanted me to cover. So I'm not going to apologize for it because I can tell you in my spirit, I don't feel like I simply meandered. I feel like I was led off in this direction. Okay, so uh, I hope that it benefited you in some way. Next week, we are going to be looking at the um, the whole issue of demons. If we understand that much of this paranormal, so much of this paranormal activity is actually in reality demonic spirits camouflaging themselves, representing themselves, costuming themselves, uh, what have you, as human spirits. If we understand that so many of these cryptic creatures and um, uh, otherworldly um, beings, you know, whether it be aliens and uh, Bigfoot and swamp monsters and uh, werewolves and skinwalkers and you name them, uh, if these things also may be, uh, and I believe are, uh, the manifestation of demonic spirits, then what do we need to know? Well, it's easy. We need to know uh, how to deal with them and what to do.
I got to tell you, the Lord gave me a dream a while back, and this is, this is one reason why I've become really convinced that um, especially alien phenomena is demonic in origin. I had a dream. It was, it was a strange dream. But in this dream, there were aliens who had come, and they were trying to, um, in essence, invade our planet. And they were walking through our streets, and they were uh, destroying people and killing people, you know. And in this dream, uh, the Lord spoke to my spirit, because I was there, and in the dream, I was there seeing this happen. And he spoke to my spirit and he said, go rebuke that spirit. And I got up and I walked up and this thing was huge. He was real big and scary looking, you know, again, almost like a Bigfoot type character. And I said, I rebuked you in Jesus. And it began to cower and it began to pull back and it began to pull back. And I, afterwards, I remembered the dream, and I thought to myself, was the Lord trying to tell me something? These things are uh, manifestations of the demonic, and um, because in my dream, I understood them to be, quote-unquote, aliens. That's how I was seeing them in my dream, you know, as aliens. And yet the Spirit of the Lord spoke and said, get up and rebuke that spirit. And I began to rebuke it. And immediately it began to cower and it began to pull back. And uh, so I believe the Lord was saying something. Anyway, folks, next week we're going to go into more detail. Uh, we're going to look at the power and the authority of the believer uh, over these uh, spirits. And we're going to... Um, bring this study, I believe, to a close, not necessarily next Wednesday. It may go another Wednesday or two. I don't know. We'll see how that plays out. I know that my teaching at this point is kind of conversational, and, and I know uh, it's different. Again, if you want to see um, it presented differently, this subject matter presented. It's going to be the same information in essence, but presented uh, in, in a little bit different a format. Then you can go to our Grace Oasis DFW. That's how you'll find it on uh, YouTube. Put the words Grace Oasis, G-R-A-C-E, O-A-S-I-S, and then in parentheses put DFW. And you'll see our channel come up. For the That was our Dallas Church channel. We were in Dallas over 20 years. Our channel has 650 subscribers, so that'll help you identify our channel. And uh, in the description of our channel, I talk about the fact that our ministry has moved and what have you. Uh, but go to the playlists in Grace Oasis TFW. And in the playlist, there'll be a playlist for Paranormal 101, and you can watch that. And it was very good. I, I enjoyed doing it, and the people really enjoyed um, receiving it. And it was very, very well received online, as you'll see. Many of those videos have thousands. Some of those sessions actually had over 10,000 views. So... Uh, I knew this subject matter was something that needed to be addressed. I just never dreamed in a million years there'd be that much interest in it and that we would get that much um, views, you know, that many views. All right, we want to close our Bible study tonight on time <laughs> with prayer. So if you bow your heads with me once again, Father, once again, God, we come before you thankful for this opportunity to explore the Word of God, thankful for the victory that we have through the power of the Holy Ghost in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Master, I pray tonight, God, 
that this study, which went in a very different direction than I had intended to go, I pray, Lord, that it will touch the heart of every hearer, will help us, Lord, to consider and come and contemplate our actions, our attitudes, bring into captivity our very thoughts. And Lord, today, if we are guilty of hating anyone, anywhere, without a cause, then I pray today, God, that you would break any spirit of hatred that may have uh, taken hold in our lives by reason of vexation, oppression, or even possession. And I claim victory and deliverance, Master, right now in the name of Jesus. No believer can give room to hate in any way, shape, size, or form. The people of God are called to love to manifest love, to demonstrate love for the God of our salvation, the God that we claim is dwelling within us, is love. And without love, the Word of God declares, we cannot know God. If we cannot love, we cannot know God. And Master, in the name of Jesus, just bring this a lesson tonight to life in our spirit. Help us, Lord, to live it, not merely to hear it and walk away, but to hear it, to contemplate it, meditate upon it, and to live it, Master. Oh, God, tonight we ask, Lord, that you would keep your hand upon your people. Move in our nation. We need a mighty spiritual revival and a renewal in our nation. The enemy has hijacked the evangelical church. And Lord, if the church is to get back on track and to uh, once again uh, perform the mission that we have been called to perform, it is going to take a divine act of God. And Lord, we pray as we uh, begin our work in Nashville, let a mighty Holy Ghost revival break out in that city. Use us, Lord. Pour your spirit out upon us. Send us people that want to worship you, people that want to pray, people that want to work for God. Master, in the name of Jesus, send us souls with a desire to establish a church that is everything the church of Jesus Christ is meant to be, a body of loving, charitable, kind, gracious, merciful people. Oh, Master, today we ask all this and none other than that precious saving name, Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, this Sunday is our last 3 o'clock service. I hope you'll join us at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time as we broadcast our final service from Huntsville, Alabama. The following week we will be in Nashville and our service time will be 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. And of course, I hope you'll join us for that as well. Uh, Wednesday night Bible study will continue to be on Wednesday, of course. We're still going to do it online at this time. We'll see how things pan out. In the f We're always going to broadcast it, but I mean, uh, we'll see in the future whether we go to a live audience or not. I would love that, but just hadn't been anything we could do here. So I hope we'll see you next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. Until we see you next, my prayer is that God would bless you richly in Jesus' wonderful name. God bless you.